First of all, this is a uh, it's a great thing because I've never seen so many people uh, attend these master classes before. So thank you very much. That makes me feel very happy uh, to see so so many wonderful bass players uh, interested in learning more about these uh, fantastic instruments. Um, the other nice thing is that we have a great mixture of sort of electric bass or bass guitar players and upright bass players. And um, so what I'm going to do, I think, for today is uh, kind of do a mixture, do, do a little bit of each, because I think in our, uh, especially in the academic world, these instruments tend to get a little bit separated. Um, and they're different instruments to be sure, but I think uh, it's nice to be able to have some uh, fluency in both instruments, or at least understand kind of what makes them tick, uh, what makes them similar, what makes them different. So uh, we'll be looking at all of that. Um, if you have any questions about what I'm saying, uh, type them in the chat. I will try to check every few minutes um, so we don't go on to a completely different uh, subject without answering your question. Um, I can't see all of you because there are too many of you. So it's like a, you know, just on the Zoom thing. It's like, if you raise your hand, I might not see you right away. So type in the chat, please. Um, very good. So um, I will start with a little bit of upright and I'll kind of go back and forth between bass guitar and upright. Um, if you have your instrument and you'd like to play along with some of these exercises, please uh, feel free to do so. They're good ones. Um, all right, so I'm going to start uh, with the upright bass. We're just going to go over some some real basic stuff to begin with. Um, a lot for, for most of you, probably for all of you, a lot of this will be review, but I think it's good to really go over the, the basics, the stance, the hold, uh, the grip, uh, the hand motions and stuff like that so that you can get a real nice clean uh, technique and start from a very good solid foundation. So I'm going to start with the upright bass first. Let me grab that. Um, so first thing I do uh, is tune with a tuner. Now there are differences of opinion and uh, students should be able to tune without a tuner, just tune by ear. Um, I think that's very important, but we do so much intonation work on the upright bass just with our fingers, placing our fingers on the fingerboard. Um, so we want to start from a place that's that's nice and solid um, in terms of our open strings being in tune. So I use this uh, tuning app. It's called Strobosoft. Oops, wait a minute. Uh, this is a paid app, but there are free apps. This one just is a little bit, a uh, little bit better. Um, it has an, a, a bass feature, which is cool. Kind of tune out some of those upper frequencies if you're in a crowded orchestra room, but you can certainly use a free one. All right, so I just do a nice, easy bow stroke. If you're, uh, if you press hard, you can kind of hear the pitch waver up just for a second. And it's tempting to do that when you're in a crowded room full of other musicians warming up. So I always try to go out in the hall or someplace quiet and just do a real nice, easy, quiet stroke like this. So I don't push the intonation sharp. Since I have a C extension here, I gotta bow the low C string and then go up from there. If you don't have a C extension on your E string, just tune your open E string. There we are. All right, cool. So a couple of things about the uh, upright bass stance. And I think, again, a lot of these are gonna translate over to uh, bass guitar as well. First thing is we wanna be balanced. Any kind of situation where you feel like you're sitting into one hip or you're you know, sticking your butt out back like this or hunching back, you know, anything that's out of balance um, is going to be what, what I call a stress position. And you never want that. Um, if, it's a, if it's a position or motion that you might not make in your daily life, it's probably not something you want to, you know, be holding for hours while you're playing an instrument. So I start just with my feet underneath my shoulders, nice, easy stance, shoulders kind of back and open. We don't want to get hunched over. And I have this in my posture in daily life where I kind of roll my shoulders forward and it's something I'm trying to I'm trying to improve on. So nice straight stance, shoulders back, chest open, and then the end pin makes kind of an L shape with the feet. And we let the base come back to us. So the base is leaning on us. You can see right here it's pretty well balanced. Right? If it falls, it's it takes a second. And if I if it does fall, I want it to fall forward. Because that way once my fingers are on the strings, that pressure will keep the bass steady. 
Now you'll notice here I'm not even using my thumb to hold the bass. I think when we get in trouble is a lot of times people let the bass fall backwards like this, and then all of a sudden I have to use my thumb to hold it up. If I don't, the bass falls. And as soon as you're using the thumb to hold the bass, you're grabbing the bass. And with uh, upright bass and bass guitar both, we want the thumb to be nice and easy, glide along the back of the neck. Right? We never want to squeeze, we never want the pressure uh, of the thumb and the clamping of the fingers to be the thing that gets the string down. What gets the string down to the fingerboard is quite simply this. Right? You can try this if you're at home, it's a great one. Just stick your arm straight out to the side and all at once relax all the muscles. Boom. That's a lot of power, a lot of weight, and I'm not working for it at all. Right? It's built into my arm. So once my arm is up here on the instrument, that's what's pushing the strings down to the fingerboard, is gravity. All right, for the right hand, we're going to cover a little bit of bow. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this leaves our electric bass players out a little bit, but it's good for everybody to, to be familiar with the bow. Uh, this is what a, a French bow. It's called a French bow. German bow has a bigger piece here. French bow you grip over the top. German bow you grip around the back like this. Okay, so we can talk more about that. If people are interested, throw it in the chat. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but for now, I'm gonna use the French bow grip just to show you this warm up that I do every day. Now, when it is cold outside, it's important for any instrument uh, that you play to warm up really well. If you don't warm up the first you know, quarter or two thirds of your practicing anywhere in there is gonna be uh, a bit of a waste because your muscles aren't gonna be moving fluidly and warmly. So always make sure to warm up. So here's my upright bass warm up. I'm gonna put my metronome on about 60. You can put it on a little slower if you want to. Slower is harder for this one. And I simply do whole notes on open strings, starting with the D string. One of those exercises that's simple, but not easy. We're looking for very quiet, almost invisible bow changes level bow perpendicular to the string and flat bow hair and we want the change of each bow to be right with the click so that it makes one sound not late like this alright that's a little bit late or early to be right with the click. So I do about 10, 20, you could do 100 of those if you want. Then you go to A string, All right? You do a few of these. And you're warming up the bass and the bow as much as you're warming up your hands. You wanna feel that vibration, feel the weight again of this arm, the bow arm going into the string. That's your source of power. You slow the metronome down, of course, it's a little bit harder. You have to have a little bit more bow control. Say between 50 and 60 is good for most people. Depends on the day for me. And that's all it is. And then I save the G string for last because the G string is furthest from the right hand. Right? And I'll just do those for about, I don't know, five minutes. It depends on how cold I am, uh, how cold it is outside, how much I feel like I need to warm up. Um, so now I'm going to show you uh, this next warm up on the bass guitar. You can do this one on upright as well. Um, so quick thing about the bass guitar and about uh, amps. This goes for uh, upright bass as well. If you are using an amp, um, there is a safety issue because these big speakers are very powerful in some cases and can do a lot of damage to people's ears if they're used wrong. Um, so this is very important. We never want to have an open connection. And what I mean by that is we never want to have one part of the cable plugged into the amp and the other part just open like this. Now we've probably all experienced something like this. We plug it in, we touch this part, it goes, <laughs> makes this terrible thumping sound. Right now on a little teeny amp like this, it's, you know, it's not really going to be a problem. But if you do it in a big, you know, a big sound system at a, um, at a church or school or something like that, and somebody happens to be walking near the speaker, it can do permanent damage to their hearing. 
So not to scare anybody, but I'm always very particular about this when I'm teaching uh, AMP uh, muscle memory. I don't ever let students plug this in and then plug this cable into their base. So here's what I always have them do. With the base over your shoulder like this, part of the cable goes into the bass guitar. I thread it through the strap first, because that way if I accidentally step on my cable, it's not gonna come out of my instrument and give us that open connection we don't want. So it's plugged into my instrument. Now the amp here is on. That's okay, doesn't matter. Just in one motion, plug it right in, boom. No crackle, no pop, no endangering anybody's ears. So that's true of upright and electric. Plug in the bass first, then the amp. All right, um, amp settings. For bass guitar, the amp is as much a part of the instrument as this is, really. Um, this is the sounding box you know, that we would have on the upright bass. It's a big old chunk of wood. Uh, this one doesn't have that. This one has a speaker and an amp. So um, oftentimes that part of the instrument gets a little bit neglected. So um, whether it's upright or electric bass, um, always pay attention to your amp settings. And the interesting thing about it is that if you take an amp into a different room, it's going to sound completely different, even with the same settings. So it's not really a question of get the settings you like, and then, you know, no matter where you take the amp, it's going to sound the same. It's not really like that. Um, so what I recommend is if you're in a place, especially a new with a new amp, uh, new speaker, new surroundings, start with all of the knobs basically at 12 o'clock. That'll be just sort of your middle of the road setting. And, you know, then start playing and see how it sounds. I can't tell you how many times I've been to concerts where the bass just sounded so tinny and clacky um, because the, the amp settings were not quite right. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail about how to set it, but don't be afraid if the settings are, look extreme on the amp. A lot of cheaper amps, you're going to roll that high end all the way off. You're going to roll those high mids all the way off. You might do the low mids, you know, in the middle, maybe even a little bit to the left and the bass, you know, at, at uh, two or three o'clock. So even if those higher knobs are all the way off, it's what sounds the best. That's what's important. Not that it looks neat on the EQ. So don't be afraid of how it looks. Go with, how, go with your ears. All right. So uh, same thing here. We've tuned with a tuner. Um, I haven't, but I think it's pretty close. <laughs> okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, similar to the, the long tone drills on the bass, I'm just going to do uh, quarter note drills here. Um, now these I'm going to do a little faster. Maybe let's call it uh, 70. That's 72. That's pretty good. Very simple. Right? Same thing. D, A, E, and G as you go across. Um, what I'm going to try to show you now is how to play through the string. So there are a couple different ways you can get good attacks. Uh, oh, wait, you can find bass headphone. Yeah. Okay, so um, you can get kind of a thumpy sound if you place your finger here and pluck. It's kind of a dead sounding tone. Not bad. But what I try to get students to do is to play through the string. So if you can see here, I'm going to try to get real close to the camera. And I'm going to start my finger above the D string. I'm going to actually, I'll do the G string, a little easier to see. So I'm going to start above the G string. I'm going to play through it and then catch the D string here. Makes a very pure attack. Now I'm lifting my finger up pretty high so you can see that I'm playing through, but really when I'm playing fast, it's only going to be just a hair off the string. I don't want to start by touching it. I want to play through. Now I'm going to mute the strings with my left hand so you can hear just that pop I'm talking about. You hear that? I want that in my sound. And uh, that's really true on upright too. So I'm going to show you that when I go back to the upright pits. Um, for most uh, bass players, electric bass players, I'm going to tell them put their thumb on the pickup. And that way you can kind of gauge where the strings are going to be without having to touch them before you play them. And that's the hard part of this technique. So you can play scales, just anything real simple, you know, to incorporate the left hand and try to play through the string. Because it can have this like taking the training wheels off uh, 
you know, kind of feeling to it because it, it just feels a little wobbly at first. You're not touching the string. So um, it'll take a little practice, but you'll get it. Uh, once you get a little more comfortable with your thumb here, you can either place it on the E string or the lowest string. Or for me, I actually just sort of let it hang over and I use it to kind of mute the other strings. Um, it's a little bit bigger of a motion because you have to rock the hand this way and that way to cross strings. But I find it very natural. See how easy my hand is hanging this way? And what I don't want is like some kind of thing where I'm really tensing my hand up like this. Right? I want it to be a very natural, you can all shake it out, find a natural position for you. Put your thumb on the pickup or wherever you like. You can go here for a different tone. Depending on where you pick, you get a different sound. That's kind of neat. So uh, those are my warm ups, my just real simple warm ups, and I do these every time. Then I want to get the left hand involved. Okay, so I'll start with the left hand on bass guitar. And then we can go to uh, to upright left hand. They're not that different. Um, let's see. Somebody said, "What do I do if I don't have an amp?" If you don't have an amp, um, it's going to be very hard to play bass guitar. Um, uh, maybe let's see. We might have uh, something at Vandercook, something a little cheap practice amp that we could loan you, possibly. So get in touch with me after that and we'll see. We'll see if we could work something out like that. Um, otherwise, there might be some kind of workaround we can figure out with your equipment at home. But but uh, contact me. My number, uh, my uh, email is the top thing in the chat. So uh, maybe copy that down somewhere. Um, you can find bass headphone amps for pretty cheap, allowing you to practice without a big expensive amp. Yeah, that's not a bad, uh, a bad comment either, to practice just directly into your headphones. Um, that's kind of neat. But nothing like hearing it out in the open air. That's how you share it with people. And, uh, um, you know, that's how you play music for people. So uh, got to get one at some point. All right, cool. Um, same thing with the left hand here. I'm going to want my thumb to be more or less right behind my second finger. The, no the fingers are numbered one, two, three, four uh, for both instruments. Um, yeah, follow along with me on a six string. That's fine. I'm using a four string right now. I have uh, a five string as well. Uh, two five strings, actually, that I love that have a low B string. So, um, yeah, follow along by all means. Any kind of any number of strings is welcome. Um, cool. So, yeah, uh, left hand. It's just going to be like, again, what I do here is I, I tell people, pick up your phone like this. Just pick it up with your fingertips, rotate it over. Take the phone out. That's pretty much your hand shape. It's very natural. And again, we're not going to be squeezing with the thumb. That's the last thing we want. So it might take a little practice for you to get that. It's not going to come overnight, but don't worry, you'll get it. Just keep being aware of it and keep working on it. Um, so on the bass guitar, there are uh, three sort of hand shapes that I use a lot. Okay. So the first one is what I call the upright fingering. So we're going to see this on the upright bass in a minute. Um, but I call, I call them the upright fingerings because three and four on the upright kind of act like one finger, like the penguin from Batman. All right, so we got one, two, and four. Three doesn't really work on, it, on its own on the upright bass. So down here, especially where the frets are kind of further apart, I'm going to use a three fret pattern using the upright fingerings. Okay, so that means I'm going to put one on the first fret, two on the second fret, and then four on the third fret. And you'll see three and four kind of land together. They're not scrunched together like that, but they do land together. They move up and down, same time. When I fret a bass, if your electric bass has frets, most of them do. Frets just mean little ridges that are raised up off the fingerboard, right? Some have them, most have them, some don't. Um, you want to play right behind the fret, not on top of it like this, because you can get a little bit of buzz if you go too far forward. You want to be just behind it so the fret stops the string. And you'll know you did it right if you get a nice long ring. Listen to that sustain. If I'm here, already gone. Okay, so the fret needs to be what stops the string. It sort of shortens the string length effectively and raise the, raises the pitch. So every fret is one half step. 
know, just like going one key up on the piano, black key or white key. And um, in this way, down in, this is what we call half position. When you have first finger on your first fret like this, it's called half position. And you can play a major scale like this. So what we're going to do is start on first finger B flat on the A string. And the strings, for those of you who might not know, are E, A, D, and G. Okay, E being the lowest string. We say it's the lowest because it's the lowest sounding pitch. But G is the highest sounding pitch. So we talk about when we say higher or lower, we mean in terms of what the note is, not in terms of how far they are away from the ground. <laughs> it can be a little confusing, so I try to be really consistent when I'm talking with students about that higher or lower always means pitch. All right, so we're going to start here. And, and the upright bass is if you've played this a little bit, you can you can join us with this because it'll be the same fingering for you guys. All right, and this will be on the A string, first fret, and that's B flat. Then we're going to put all four fingers down for C. Then we're going to play open D, first finger E flat, fourth finger F, open G, second finger A fourth finger B flat and we're going to go back the same way we went up four two open uh, so yeah open four one open four and one and that's the B flat major scale all right so now I'm going to show you that same scale on the upright bass I'm not going to unplug right now. I'm just going to turn my volume all the way down, um, which you should do before you put it on the rack or put it aside. If you have your bass overnight, make sure that everything is unplugged from the amp and from here. Um, for regular pickups like this one, these are not electric. Uh, these don't have any electric, uh, like, what am I trying to say, added battery or anything. They're called passive pickups. Uh, that won't do anything. But if you do have a battery in there, and you come back the next day, that battery will be dead if you leave everything plugged in. So um, I just get in the habit of unplugging uh, everything if I'm going to leave it overnight. Okay, this volume is down. Hang it up on the rack here. And I know some of you don't have bows for your basses. You're more jazz players. So we're going to cover a jazz uh, pits. Actually, both styles of pits. Why not? Before we get into this scale. So the classical style pits is fairly... Uh, easy to pick up. You just put your your finger on the you start with your finger on the string, and you kind of lift it away from the instrument. It sounds a little thin. Sounds very woody. You hear a lot of the wood. And when you have six or eight bass players in an orchestral section playing that way, oh, it sounds magnificent. We don't want too much thump, too much pop uh, in that sound. We just want a nice, uh, a nice rolling bubble to the sound. Um, but when you play jazz, or you're the only bass player in a, you know, in a, a second line kind of band or something like that, uh, you want that bass to be really thumping. So this is the jazz pits. It's a little bit more of a, a, a maybe a difficult technique for most people to pick up, but you'll get it. So first thing to remember is that arm weight drill. I go back to this often just dropping the arm. It looks so simple, but uh, students love to do it. <laughs> and uh, it's just a good reminder because a, a lot of times we sort of let the arm down easy like this. And that's not it. You don't put your arm down at your side. You just relax all the muscles at once. Boom. And that's where we get the power for our pits, just like the bow. So what I'm going to do here is I have kind of smaller hands. I don't have those incredible Ron Carter baseball mitt hands. <laughs> so if you're like me and you have human size hands, uh, what you're going to want to do is put two fingers together and kind of make them into one finger. Um, and I like this because I get more meat on the string. And for this kind of sound, I want more meat on the string. So I kind of like pretend that these are two fingers. Uh, I'm sorry, pretend that these two fingers are one finger. Now, I same thing, I want to play through the string. So I lift them just off the A string and play through. hear that wonderful thump and I'll mute again with my left hand so you don't hear the sustain you just hear that pop all right 
That's something I want in my sound. And I'll try to give you an example of, of, of this. I'm going to walk a quick bass line, one where I'm playing through the string and one where I'm not playing through the string. So here's not playing through the string. This is the sort of the grab, pull, release bow and arrow technique. Now I'm going to play through. Right, a lot more power to that sound. And I didn't really have to work much harder to get it because um, I'm dropping the arm. Let me read a couple of comments here. Uh, upright with the side of my finger, but only one finger. Yeah, that's a great technique. And that's more the Ron Carter technique that I was talking about. That's where you put, instead of uh, playing two fingers on the string, you rock your hand, or you, depending on your hand shape, you, you just get a whole bunch of your index finger on the string at once. Now you see, I can get a good sound that way. But for me, for my hands, I have to kind of roll my hand over so far to get that much meat on the string that for me, it, it just slows me down too much. Um, if I'm going to play like a, you know, a real thick, like 12, eight, you know, you know, something like that. Um, I might do that just to get that, that sound. And that's how my teacher, Jeff Campbell, uh, from Eastman used to play or does play is that kind of side of the finger thing. Um, but he's got huge hands. So, uh, it's kind of like whatever works for you, whatever gives you that sound that you're looking for. Um, but for me, I have to rotate so much that I lose facility. Uh, so I couldn't make it work, but if it works for you, that's great. Um, uh, what would I do with my fingerings if my hands are small on an upright? Okay, let me get to that one. That actually leads very nicely into what I'm talking about now. Um, I hear this quite a bit um, from uh, students that are kind of not quite beginners, but have played for a little while. They say, oh, my hands are too small. So it's hard to tell on here, but my hands are quite small for a bass player. Um, I can only reach a tenth on the piano, and that's really if I'm if I'm stretching. Um, and the uh, TA at my school uh, was from China, and she's maybe this tall compared to me. And her hands came up to here, right? Uh, maybe like up to the bottoms of my fingernails, and she flew over the bass. So, first thing I want to just encourage you to do is get rid of that idea that you're too small to play the bass, that your hands are too small. That's not a thing. We need to find an instrument that's right for you to play. Uh, we need to find a good technique that you can play in a sustainable and pain-free way. And those ways do exist, uh, even for the smallest of us. Now, are you going to be playing a, you know, a full-size uh, Prescott bass? Probably not, you know. But um, any sort of standard size three-quarter, um, uh, even a hundred-pound person can play them. So uh, it'll take some work, but uh, maybe, again, get in touch with me and uh, we can you know, talk about maybe some of your technique that might help you. But that's a great question. So um, try to make this so you can see the left hand. Again, the hand is going to be very similar to the bass guitar, just kind of rolled this way, thumb behind the second finger. Okay, and we're going to put it down. I'm going to shrink the end pin a little bit. It's going to be a little short for me, but that way it'll be a better view on the camera for you all. Okay. Is that any better? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back to half position here, maybe about an inch, inch and a half from the, the nut, the back part where the strings are. And I'm going to play a B flat with one. Same scale we just did on the bass guitar, same fingering. So here we go. One, B flat, four is C, open D, first finger E flat. Fourth finger F, open G, second finger A, fourth finger B flat, and we go down the way we came. Two, open, four, one, open, four, and one. 
right? So that's that's kind of how the left hand works uh, on the upright bass. Very similar, actually, uh, in the back uh, sort of three fret position of the bass guitar. Um, one thing I would like you all to notice is that um, when I say four, I don't just mean my pinky finger, right? It's not it's not this where my hand is floating off the edge of the fingerboard, right? It's the same note, but boy, do I have to work hard for that. I got to torque my hand this way to get the string down. So when I say four, I mean four fingers on the string. And finger teamwork is a huge thing on both instruments. We don't want to have one finger pushing down the string when it doesn't have to. Sometimes you're going to be bridging, you know. If it's a specialty kind of lick like that, you do what you can to get the lick out. But if you're playing a scale, you're playing one, playing four, all four fingers drop at the same time. All the knuckles and joints are curved nicely like this. So it's like a bridge. Oftentimes you'll see a break in a student's finger that looks like that, where the small joint breaks backwards. You don't want that, okay? Because then you're asking the ligament between these two bones to pull the string like a rubber band. Okay, whereas if you do this, you got the bridge of your bones. Uh, same way you see a, the shape of any bridge is curved nicely like this. Um, got a few more chats here. Um, question about the bow. I'm going to have to come back to that. How can I project more sound while using pizzicato without it sounding like thumping? Um, if you can clarify that, do you mean with the classical pits or with the jazz pits? Um, the thumping oftentimes comes from, if I understand you correctly, with the jazz pits, the thumping will come, I think you mean something like this. Where it's like a lot of like attack and the right hand feels right, but you don't get any pitch center or sustain. Now the way that I got that was I didn't push the string all the way to the fingerboard. It's sort of like hovering between, halfway between its natural state and the fingerboard, but the fingerboard is not stopping the string cold. So the fingerboard's got to stop the string if you want that clearest sound with a lot of sustain. And how do you get that? Do you do it by squeezing with the hand? No! You do it by letting gravity do the work. And sometimes if I, if I feel like I'm pinching, and we all pinch, we all grab. It's human nature, so it's something we have to work around a little bit. Um, and when I get tired, when I get mentally fatigued, I sometimes grab, right? And I feel it in my hands. I know something is wrong because my shifting is slow and it's, I'm just in tune with it, right? So what I'll do in that situation is I'll kind of put my thumb here on the other side and just play a little scale with my thumb up here, right? I don't even need my thumb to get those pitches. Just a good reminder that the thumb does not oppose the fingers like this. Yes, using classical pits with a more clear sound, sure. So I think the same thing there, uh, they were asking about the thumping sound. So I think the same thing there. If you're here and you're not pushing the string all the way down to the fingerboard, you're going to get that. So here it's going to be a little more clear. Um, another thing about classical pits, I think more often than not, they should be vibrated just a little. And I'm surprised how oftentimes uh, in sections people just play a straight tone pizzicato. Um, it makes the any intonation differences kind of stick out. It, it sort of quiets them down. It, it just a little more lively when you give a, a, a little bit of vibrato to it. Um, but yeah, think about being heavy from here, letting the arm sink into the string, and then just. There's a limit to how far you can go with this because if you're plucking away from the fingerboard, eventually you're going to get that where the fingerboard kind of snaps. So in that case, if you really need more sound after that, you might have to sort of find a, a hybrid between the classical pits and the jazz pits where you're plucking to the side. And sometimes when it's marked triple forte in an orchestra piece, I'm using jazz pits. Anything to get the sound just pushed forward. So um, a lot of these little quote unquote rules don't always apply. You know, it depends on the situation. You got to make the music and that's got to happen here first. So whatever technique anybody says is right or wrong, you know, uh, it just depends on the situation. Um, I think people that have bad technique are sometimes looked down upon, like they're lesser musicians. 
and they are not. Um, you can make beautiful music with crappy technique. That's not to say that you should have it. Um, like Charlie Hayden, for example, is one of my favorite jazz bass players, and his technique is kind of rough. He, you know, he's kind of got you know a lot of weird stuff going on, and um, it means that he can't play super fast. But he's developed a style that where he doesn't need to do that. He plays very clear, articulate, beautiful, slow lines um, with a lot of finesse. Problem is he's got tendonitis like crazy up and down his arms and shoulders, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Um, I've had a few little bouts with tendonitis, and it's no fun. So that's why I'm going off so much about this basic technique, uh, because I think that just a good, balanced, sustainable technique, you're going to be able to play bass for many more years um, with the most facility that you can have. Um, and there's no, you can't put a price on that. You know, what's an extra 10 years of playing bass? You know, it's, I would give almost everything I had for that. So, all right. Um, what is the difference between jazz pits and orchestral pits? Okay, one more time. Jazz pits is, is this one to the side where we're playing through the string. Orchestral pits is where we're kind of grabbing the string and pulling it away from the instrument. Get, oops, getting a little bit more of that wood sound. Hope that answers your question. Okay, let's look at a couple of other hand shapes on the bass guitar. So um, one of the major differences between the instruments, of course, is that the, the notes are so much closer together on bass guitar. Strings are shorter, therefore the half steps are shorter. So there are a couple of other useful hand shapes you can do on this instrument that uh, um, don't really exist on the upright as much. So we're gonna look at, a, we looked at the three fret pattern, right, which is one, two, sorry, Turn this up a little bit. One, two, four, right on the first three frets. Now in the middle of the bass, and you can really do this anywhere, it just depends on your hand size and shape, but generally in the middle range of the bass here, I'm gonna to start to use a four fret pattern more often. Um, I can do it down here, but oh boy, look at how much that stretches my hand. I don't wanna to have to do that for too long. Now, if I have to play F to A flat, a groove in, you know, like that with a four string bass. Well, guess what? That's my only choice. So I'm going to make it work. <laughs> but uh, if I do have a choice, I'm going to start to go up here and, and the notes get a little bit closer together. So um, I'm going to do a D scale. Now, this is what I call the closed position because I'm going to play no open strings, right? An open position would be like this. I start an open D. But here I'm going to play in a closed position. So I'm going to go up to the fifth fret. That's going to be, for most instruments, that second dot is your fifth fret. And I'm going to play second finger D on the A string. All right, same, same note as the open D. Okay, and I'm going to have one finger per fret. All right, so not three frets like I did before, but four frets. So I'm going to play second finger, on the a, uh, second finger D on the A string. Now I'm going to play fourth finger. You'll notice I'm not holding three up like this. Try not to make a rude hand gesture at you all. So two, and then four drops along with three. Then I'm gonna play one on the next string over. Two, four, one, three, and four. Come down the same way we did, D is four, two is C, oh, I'm sorry, C sharp is three, my fault. Let me start over, D. C sharp is three. I'm trying to read the chats and play. B is one. A is four. D is two. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, G is two. F sharp is one. E is four. D is two. All right, so I'll play it a little faster. so you can see it in context. about this closed shape is that you can move this shape anywhere on the bass guitar and it will work if you just remember that fingering right so I can take it up here I'm gonna take it down here two four one two four one three four right and that shape will work any literally anywhere on starting on the E and A strings right as long as you have three strings to play uh, that works. 
So those are the two uh, main shapes that I would think about uh, learning first for bass guitar. The three fret pattern, again, that works anywhere. And the four fret pattern. And then once you get a little bit more advanced, you'll, you'll do a five fret pattern, but of course you have to shift a little bit for that. Right? And this way you get a chromatic scale, which is cool. But it's a little bit more advanced because you have to you have to shift you have to move your hand this way and this way. All right. Um, so maybe we should talk a little bit about shifting. That's an important thing to do. We do it all the time on both instruments. So I'm going to go back to upright because that one has a bigger shift to learn. But this one will work on both instruments. Okay. Now shifting is something we have to do all the time because we're responsible for about what is that three and a half feet of wood. Uh, and of course, if you're off by this much, it's out of tune. Um, so learning to play, especially this thing in tune, is uh, it's really a labor of love. But when you get it in tune, it's beautiful because it's the oftentimes the lowest note in the voicing, and it supports all the notes above it. And if the bass player is out of tune, it's like having a weak foundation on a building. The whole building is like wobbly, right? So we got to give it that strong fundamental at the bottom and let the whole chord sit on top. And it's very powerful when you get it right. It's just a wonderful feeling. So um, a lot of that is going to come from shifting. So maintaining a good hand shape. Two is going to be right in the middle between one and four. And then here's where the thumb comes in. And you heard me saying earlier, we don't want to grip. Well, this is a big reason why. Because when we shift, the thumb is responsible for moving the hand. Joop, 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 joop. The fingers are pistons. They go up, they go down. They go up, they go down. Up up, down, down, right? They never reach, they never do this. I don't wanna say never, but for our purposes right now, they don't, okay? They're just pistons, up and down. And then the thumb goes this way, back and forth. So this way we distribute the work around the hand. That's very important because if we're here and we're playing four and we have to shift way up here and play four, boy, that's a lot of work, especially if we're playing 16th notes to play this note, release, shift, push down, right? All in the space of one sixteenth note. Boy, that's too much work for one little pinky finger to do on its own. So um, we're very tied into our thumbs as human beings. Uh, some might say that uh, has helped develop our brains, you know, into these magnificent things that uh, we have and make wonderful instruments like this because we have these thumbs, right? So we're very, our brains are extremely tied into our thumbs. So that's, we can use that to our advantage here. As the thumb feels the passage of the fingerboard behind us, that's going to be how we gauge our distance. We don't look. Um, you know, you can to sort of practice, but when I do like this, it throws off my whole setup. My shoulders go out of whack, everything like that. So if I do have to look at my hand, I want to use a mirror, kind of behind where my camera would be right now. Full length mirror so I can keep my gaze forward. But aside from that, I'm doing it by feel and by hearing. Okay, so this is a great exercise. You can do this on electric too. We're going to go from uh, second fret, which is A uh, on the G string, right? That'd be second fret on the G string for, for the bass guitarist. And we're going to go up to D. That's going to be the seventh fret for the bass guitarist. And for the us upright bass players, this is what I call the block, the neck block. And your thumb is going to go boom, right in that slot. That's where you're going to feel it. And above that is going to be D on the G string, a fifth above the open string. Okay? So, this is how I do this exercise. This is my shifting exercise. And I do this after my long tones that I showed you at the very beginning of the class. Okay. exercise roughly in three four but I don't use a metronome for this one. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. If you're playing bass guitar you just pluck it. Right, so A, D, E, E, B, A. Um, I don't use position numbers because us bass players cannot get it together with our consistency in terms of position numbers. 
So um, when I refer to, to shifts, I'll refer to a note name and the string. Uh, I do that in my sheet music too. Some people call this seventh position, some people call it fourth position. Um, they're just, for whatever reason, the technique books for this instrument are, have not been unified. So uh, I find it more, it does more harm than good to refer to position numbers. So I call this the block position, which would be seventh fret on the bass guitar. It's an octave from the next lower string or a fifth from its own open string. So we've done one to four. After I do, I don't know, 10 or 15 of those, then I'm going to go here, one, one, two. So same positions, just different fingers. And I want to hear that glissando in the shift. Helps me study the shift itself. Do 10 or 15 of those, then I'm going to go two, two, four. So same exact hand placement, just different fingers, right? B flat, E flat, E natural, E natural, B natural, B flat. Uh, and then I go back to one to four. To balance out the, balance out the hand. So basically you've seen me, what I'm doing in my warm up is I'm warming up the right hand first, then I'm warming up the left hand by pressing down the string and shifting. And depending on the day, I might do this for five minutes or 15 minutes, anywhere in there. Uh, Cause that way when I start practicing, everything's warm, everything's feeling the vibrations, my ears have warmed up. And mentally I've kind of come to a place where I'm not worried about the car that needs repair or the fridge that's empty or the, you know, all the daily life stuff. I've kind of centered myself and, and gotten ready to focus on just practicing for a while. And it's a very freeing for me. Uh, as a grown up, I got two little kids and I got, you know, a hundred million things going on. And so I value that practice time where I can just focus on me and my bass and my music. And I really look forward to that uh, when I do get that time. So um, this is kind of my, the, just the basic setup um, and execution for both instruments. I know it's kind of like just scratching the tiniest tip off the iceberg, but um, hopefully some of these fundamentals are helpful to you. And for whatever piece you're working on, if you can employ some of these techniques into working on, in, into working on those pieces, um, you'll get a little bit more facility. You'll get to be able to play them a little bit more in tune and a little bit more comfort. Um, you know, your shoulders might not feel so tight. Your hands might not feel so tight. So, um, uh, Feel free to ask me any questions. I thought I would leave a few minutes at the end in case anybody would like to get on the mic and say something or ask a question. Would anybody like to do that? I'll give you a few minutes to, to figure it out. Uh, thank you for coming. What would be the best form when holding a bow in your hand? Would something like using your thumb and pushing away from you be a good option? Um, so uh, if you could clarify, are you talking about German bow or French bow? Uh, that's an important distinction. You have both instruments. That's awesome. Keep playing them both. And as much as they're, you know, I've heard people say that electric and upright bass are uh, as different as trumpet and snare drum. And there is some truth to that, but also there are things that carry over. So I think um, it's really useful to play, for instance, bass concertos on the electric bass, because it sort of helps you see how everything is laid out. And um, you know, upright bass just has an amazing sound to it. There's no way to kind of copy that uh, with a bass guitar. What kind of pickup do you use on your double bass? Great question. Um, I use a Fishman Full Circle, and that is a, um, I want to say it's three or $400, and you have to have a luthier put it onto your bass. The pickup itself is actually the bridge adjuster. Um, and I like that because it doesn't wedge in the bridge and keep the bridge from vibrating like a lot of the cheaper pickups do. So uh, it is a cost difference. Um, if you're looking for the cheapest thing available, get an Underwood uh, that wedges into the side of the bridge. You can find used ones on eBay for a hundred bucks. They sound a little tinny. How would be the correct way for playing bass guitar with a guitar pick? Uh oh, don't let Davey504 hear you that, say that. <laughs> he's, just, he's a bass YouTuber. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not an expert on playing with the pick. I've done it on some commercial sessions and I did it by saying, yeah, I can play with a pick. 
and then I did my best. Um, but uh, basically, let's see if I have one here. Sorry, I'm looking behind my computer for a pick. Um, the way that I did it was kind of hold it sideways like this, and I try to hold it loose so that it's not real stiff, so that it has a little bit of give around the string. And what I did to kind of get ready for that, I had a few minutes, so I just set my metronome real quietly, and I just tried to play 16th notes, do, 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 and get it real even, because I didn't really know what I had to play. So it ended up not being too difficult, and it went fine. Remember also that where you play with the pick on the string, like whether it's near the bridge or near the neck, that can make a huge difference in the tone. So um, always use your ears, trust your musicianship. If there's a sound or something that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck, don't ignore that. It's crucial because the next time you come back to it, it might not have the same impact, you know. So listen for that sound. If something really excites you and kind of gets you on a emotional level, um, always pay attention to that as an artist. It's super important. Um, how would I know if my bow is over rosined? Good question. Um, who was talking about pizzicato? I'm sorry. Which, what do you? Uh, oh, thanks. Okay, I'll get. To, thank you for the rewording. I'll get to that in a second. Um, how do you know if your bow is over rosined? Um, I guess if it's sticking too much and if it's kind of going <laughs> across the string, um, I think people put rosin on top of dirty rosin too often. So let me show you a, a way to kind of clear it up, especially when it gets real dry. Like it is now outside. I don't know where you all are from. I'm in Chicago, and it's a it's an ice cube. So you never want to touch the hair of the bow on the front with your fingers because you don't want to get the oil of it on there. But if you take your thumbnail and, and along the back and kind of just give it a flick, I don't know if you can see it on the on the camera, but there's a little powder coming off my bow. That's just dusty old rosin. It's not doing anything but making the bow slick. So when you feel that slickness, you might want to rosin like this. Yeah. And um, if, if you do that, you're just kind of putting sticky rosin on top of dirty powder. So always give it a flick. If, if you really feel like it's powdery, use an old toothbrush to clean the hair off. Um, don't brush your teeth with that toothbrush afterwards. <laughs> Word of warning. Um, or if you want, if you really want to go after it, you can use a flea comb uh, from a pet store. Just go get a flea comb and, and go over it like this. You're not going to hurt the hair. Uh, that takes everything off, though. So maybe start with the toothbrush. Um, wipe your strings down with a nice cotton cloth, old T-shirt. If you want to get really fancy, you can buy a bag of rags from Home Depot. Um, don't wipe down the the strings on the where your fingers go, and the rosin with the same rag. You know, use it. Use the other side of the rag, or use a different rag so you don't cross pollinate. Um, rewording of my question: What would be the best when holding a bow in your hand while plucking the string? Okay, great question. Yeah, so with a French bow, it's it's fairly easy. You just tuck it up in your hand, zoop, like this, and plug, right, and out. Fold in, bow goes up, and pluck. With a German bow, it's a little bit more complicated. You actually let it drop this way, and pluck here, boom, boom, boom. It's a little hard, because sometimes the bottom of the bow wants to whack the instrument. You gotta practice this a little bit, and then you kind of throw it back up. So for German bow players, this requires a little more practice. For French bow players, it's fairly standard. Cool. Um, what type of case would be better for an electric bass? Um, I have a mono case. Uh, it was a little on the expensive side. It's like a gig bag, um, but it's 10 years old and it looks like it could have just come out of the store. It's like unbelievably amazing. And I, I gig a lot. So I've taken it to, in, in that time, I've taken it to hundreds of gigs. Uh, mono, M-O-N-O. -O. Um, what is a good rule of thumb for vibrato on open strings? Would it be better to play them closed? Um, yeah, it's impossible to play vibrato on open strings by definition, unless you're kind of like doing something weird with the tuning key, I guess. I've never seen that. So if you want vibrato on that note, you've got to play it uh, with the left hand closed on a lower string. All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, please stay in touch. My email, uh, dbistro at vandercook.edu, it's at the top there. Um, please feel free to get in touch if you wanna have a lesson at Vandercook or a lesson online. 
I've done that um, a lot, so please get in touch. Um, I also offer some asynchronous courses through Vandercook where uh, you watch a good deal of content that I have up there and read my notes. It gives you assignments. Uh, you, do, you make videos of yourself doing the assignments on your own time. And then uh, I give you written comments and sometimes video and, and uh, audio comments as well for each of the units. So um, yeah, and Heidi's there too, if you have any questions about how to sign up for those courses. Thank goodness she's here because I have no idea. I just do base stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you very much everybody for attending. Thank you for all the nice uh, thank yous in the, in the comments. Um, you all are the best. <laughs>